question came up yesterday about the difference between Mahayana and Theravada. And one of the important differences is how they view samsara. For the Mahayana, samsara is a place. And because it's a place, if someone does a lot of good, develops a lot of good qualities, and then leaves that place, they're leaving everybody else in a lurch. Which is why they say that the truly generous and compassionate person wants to hang around, doesn't want to leave samsara. In fact, they define it as being identical with nirvana, if you look at it the right way. So if you hang around and you continue doing a lot of good for people, you don't want to leave that place, take all your good qualities with you and abandon others. But the early teachings don't treat samsara as a place, they teach it as a <clears throat> treat it as a process. This literally means the wandering on. And you don't just wander. You create the worlds in which you want to wander into. And they involve feeding. And it's addictive. So samsaras are basically a bad habit. Where you have an idea, you'd like to have this kind of pleasure, but it's going to cost that amount of suffering, both for yourself and for other people. Which means that stopping the process, stopping the addictive habit, is actually good for yourself and for the others. On the one hand, you're giving a good example. On the other hand, you're basically taking one more person out of this addictive process. So the idea that you would want to wait until everybody else got over the addiction before you're willing to give up your addiction doesn't make any sense. We could look at samsara like a big mud fight. I splash mud on you, you splash mud on me, and then I splash mud on you back because you splash mud on me. And it goes back and forth like this and it never ends. And so the idea of trying to straighten everybody out or trying to settle the score, again, makes no sense. There's that famous story of some dead doe. junior monk came to see him one time and complained that another monk had hit him over the head for no reason at all. He hadn't done anything to the other monk. The other monk was just a really bad guy, and he came up and hit him. And some dead doe said, well, you hit him first. And the junior monk said, no, no, he came up and hit me first. I didn't do anything to him at all. And some dead doe kept insisting, no, you hit him first. And so the young monk went to complain to some dead doe's superior, who must have been the supreme patriarch. And some dead doe was questioned about this. Why did you keep insisting that the other, this monk, the innocent monk, had hit the other monk first? And some dead doe said, "Well, it's karma. If this monk had never hit that other monk, he wouldn't have been hit back." The idea of settling scores makes sense if you have a clear beginning point and a clear end point. But when the beginning point, as the Buddha said, cannot be found, how are you going to figure out what the score is? So you want to think in this way. When things come up in your meditation, you start thinking about events in your past, people who abused you, people who did horrible things to you, or people who are still doing horrible things to you. You have to ask yourself, well, maybe I've done something to that person. That just doesn't excuse the other person or exonerate the other person. I mean, just the two of you have been entangled in this back and forth, and you don't know when it began. And so the best thing is to say, okay, I'm just going to not continue the back and forth. Wish the other person well. If reconciliation is possible, you go for reconciliation. If it's not, you go for forgiveness. Because you realize that not every score is going to get settled. And again, in a mud fight, whoever the question of who splashed more mud on the other person after all becomes really irrelevant. It's not the kind of score you want to keep, the score you want to settle. It's, it's a fight you want to get out of. That passage we talked about today where the, the head of the Asuras had said, you know, if other people see you being restrained while they abuse you, think you're weak, and that might make them do it even more. And Saka says, no, 
you have to look. At, you can't look out at after the other person's behavior. You have to look out after your own. If you stop, that's the only way this back and forth is going to stop. It's like somebody throws something at you and falls at your feet. Well, just leave it there. One of the ways we meditate is to learn how to see these things as not hitting us. It just goes right past, right past. Their words go past. Even if they hit your body, it's not you. That's one of the uses of the not-self strategy. It's just the body. You have an awareness that's separate from that, that's not besmirched by that. The only thing that can besmirch your awareness is what you do. So when things like this come up in your meditation, you realize, okay, this has been a back and forth that's best to get out of. It's a process that, again, it's, we're not here in a place that we're trying to establish a just or paradisical society, or even a fair society. I mean, you can decide that oh, this kind of behavior, you have to realize you're not the only person who's been involved in this kind of behavior. Everybody has been involved in back and forth to some extent. If not precisely the way you've been involved, they've got their own involvement. Then you decide. You have the freedom to decide, well, if you want to fight for other people to help get them out of this kind of situation, make that your gift to humanity. That's your choice. It can be a form of generosity. But you have to realize that people have their choices, and they can choose to follow along with your idea of what's good, or they can choose not to. And the Buddha never said that we're here to clean up the mud fight. We're here to get out of the mud fight. No your idea of how things should be. That's what a lot of the mud fights are all about, is what, you know, how to redress old wrongs. And there comes a point you have to realize that the best way is to get out, for the two reasons I mentioned. One is that you're no longer oppressing the other person. You're no longer creating bad karma for yourself. And you create a good example. You set a good example for other people. Now, they have the right to choose to be inspired by your example or not be inspired. You can't control that. What you can control is the kind of example you set. So you have the choice. So you're going to be the sort of person who, whose life is totally ruined by something that someone else did or is continuing to do. Or you're going to learn how to step outside, step to the side. And say, okay, those things happened, and who knows when it started. But I don't have to be directly involved anymore. I don't have to be identifying with the fight, identifying with my role in the fight, identifying with my avatar that I've designed here. And drop the whole thing. Now, they may continue to come back at you for a while, but there comes a point where it ends. Then you've created one more stellar example. It's kind of like the black holes that are surrounded by light. You create a good example, and you create a lot of light for the world. And that's actually a gift. Getting out of the process is a gift. We're involved in this addictive process. And the best way you can put an end to it is to end your addiction. And if you have the time and the energy and the talent, then you help give information to other people on how they can do, do the same. That's how compassion really works, both for yourself and for the world around you.